uh, it's a great pleasure for me uh, to be invited to keep Cicely Saunders International Annual Lecture this year. Um, Raisa, you have already mentioned the title and um, I will declare no conflicts of interest related to this talk. And what I will go into here is outlined here. I will try to give an overview over long term opioid therapy in a changing environment. First of all, we all know that the trajectories of cancer are changing uh, with longer survival. Secondly, new data uh, coming out of the US has indicated that the uh, opioid addiction in cancer, the prevalence is higher than formerly expected. We are also striving, many of us, to have earlier interventions in palliative care and particular in oncology. We are trying to come in earlier in the trajectory and integrate our interventions with the oncologist. There are many RCTs in this area and more are coming up. Finally, we also have to look at the lessons we learned from opioid therapy in chronic non-cancer pain. And uh, actually, the paper you can see on this slide uh, is about long-term treatment of uh, cancer patients with opioids, uh, patients that live for six to nine years. And some of the patterns we have seen in chronic, chronic non-cancer area are also seen here, increasing opioid doses and the concomitant use of um, uh, hypnotics and benzodiazepines, which could indicate problematic use. And then there's also an area of organ failure and opioid use, which is a little bit beyond my, my talk here. First of all, the prevalence of pain in different populations of patients, here some pooled data, is more or less the same. We have seen these figures over and over again, and patients under curative treatment, the prevalence is about 50, 55%, and with advanced and terminal diseases, even higher. Then there's a new growing population of uh, cancer survivors, which have higher prevalences of pain, much higher than the norm population. And we have a number of recent guidelines. When I say recent guidelines, the first one was uh, the guideline from EAPC uh, about the use of opioids in uh, palliative care from 2012. Then we have the N, uh, CCN cancer guideline, we have one from ESMO, and we have the latest one from WHO in, uh, 2000, from 2019. And some of the common features for these guidelines on pain and opioid management are that they are today evidence-based, they are based on the great system or other systems, there's a general international consensus about them, and they can, of course, be adapted to local needs around the world. They all recognize that opioids are essential medicines, and they are the mainstay for treatment of, of moderate to severe cancer pain. Further, some of them mention that there's a lack of availability and accessibility of opioids in low and middle income countries, and there's a overuse in some high income countries. In these guidelines, general principles of opioid management are dealt with, including the treatment of side effects like constipation, nausea, sedation, cognitive dysfunction, hyperalgesia, and to some extent addiction. However, most of these recommendations are based on low level evidence. Even common things we do in the daily clinical practice like opioid switching, giving opioids by other routes like the subcutaneous route, uh, treatment of side effects are relatively low evidence and based on such. And even the analgesic ladder, tree stick ladder, is uh, not well investigated. There are a few studies, a few RCTs comparing a two-step ladder from non-opioids to strong, 
step three opioid or the three uh, compared to the three later steps, but most of these studies are underpowered. So there's certainly a controversy uh, regarding step two opioids. But the long term exposure is important. And where are the issues? First of all, addiction is becoming an issue. And a lot of this discussion is going on with a background curtain of the opioid epidemic in the US. I'll go into that a little bit later shortly. Then we have other long term effects like physical dependence, tolerance development, opioid induced hyperalgesia, cognitive dysfunction, dysfunction of the immune and reproductive system, which is under research these days, and of course, many others like uh, constipation, nausea, etc., can also be uh, long lasting uh, side effects. But returning to opioid addiction, there are many terms out there. And in the literature, this is used interchangeable, and I will also in this talk use it interchangeable. Of course, we have definitions for opioid addi addiction from the ICD-10 and 11 and from DSM-5, but these are general, uh, general definitions of addictions and we need actually specific definitions for the use of opioids in a pain condition. And terms like opioid abuse, misuse are used, opioid dependence, aberrant opioid behavior, problematic opioid use, which are quite broad terms are used, and a very modern one now, non-medical opioid use, opioid use disorder, and chemical coping, which is used often in cancer patients, but it's also alluding to the misuse of different other substances like alcohol, illegal drugs, etc. So if we look at the prevalence, and here's some new data on the prevalence of opioid addiction in cancer patients. We know that the prevalence in chronic non-cancer pain is very high. Here are some studies among others, many others, one from Denmark in 2010 and one from Israel in 2017, where they looked at chronic non-cancer patients referred to pain clinics. And actually the prevalence is very high here because Probably many general practitioners refer patients to the pain clinics in order to have treated their opioid uh, aberrant behavior. And here they have used uh, the Portnoy criteria to characterize these patients and to screen this patient for aberrant opioid related behavior. However, in 2018, this study came out from Eduardo Breyer's group where they examined cancer patients 751 attending a supportive care unit at a comprehensive cancer center in Texas and using the SOAP, which is another, uh, which is another questionnaire that's screened and used to monitor patients with, um, uh, with opioid related uh, addiction, they found almost 20% here. So of the same magnitude as found in, in, uh, in chronic non-cancer pain patients. And actually, the early intervention of palliative care, which is very hot at the moment, combined with the prescriptions of, of opioids, is of course an opportunity to get skilled people into this field and to prescribe opioids in a responsible way. And Gartner and co-worker actually made this pragmatic guidance for, uh, for, pa for palliative care teams. And I will uh, quickly go through these 10 steps. Step one was admit the problem. Addiction and other toxicity is always of potential concern. I think we have been a little bit in palliative care reluctant to admit the problem. Step two was understand the neurobiology on non nociceptive systems, screen patients, identify patients at risk. The problem here is that we have no consensus about many of these instruments and many of them can be criticized. Step four, tapering off patients uh, or lower the doses 
They could even be an exit strategy for some patients. This is, as we all know, in clinical reality, very, very difficult. But a step five, I think it's very relevant to monitor over time and consider further sur surveillance uh, measures. Then we should also consider alternative intervention, make priority of the pharmacological treatment in cases of neuropathic pain use, a human drug as a first step, not always opioids as the first step, but also consider non-pharmacological treatments. Be cautious in long-term treatment for uh, rapid onset formulation like the fentanyl formulations, and also be able to make a structured interdisciplinary collaboration surrounding risky patients with, for instance, addictive medicine. Educate patients and staff about the storage, use, disposal of opioids in order to uh, counteract diversion. And step 10, continue to fight opiophobia. Maybe, in my personal opinion, this should be of a higher priority. So, Going to the non pharma the the chronic non cancer area, I will just start with this slide that demonstrates the um, the opioid epidemic in the United States. And probably most of you have seen this slide before. It started uh, in the late 90s with a reckless and, and immoral uh, marketing from the pharmaceutical industry and a lot of uh, addictive. Uh, cases turned up in the beginning. And since that, there were other waves where uh, illicited drugs like heroin and synthetic uh, fentanyl came into the market and further fueled this epidemic. So the problem is, uh, and, and some of the main points of the opioid epidemic was that there were commercial determinants and that the epidemic was orchestrated by the pharmaceutical industry, but there were also medical societies like the pain societies, the American one and the European one, and committees that promoted to introduce opioid therapy to chronic lung cancer pain. And a few years ago, we estimated that, for instance, in Denmark, with a relatively high consumption, two thirds of the population, uh, two thirds of the consumption was by chronic non-cancer pain patients. Further uh, committees considered pain as a fifth vital sign and uh, during accreditation, and a response to this was very open opioids uh, without a critical uh, approach. Furthermore, post-marketing surveys considered the risk of addiction for minimal, and all this led to uh, a public health emergency in the US during the Trump administration. And since that, FDA has taken several measures together with other uh, regulatory bodies in the US in order to curb uh, the, the opioid, opioid ep epidemic. If you look into Europe, the, the consumption is very scattered. We have a high consumption generally in the Nordic country, in the Scandinavian countries a low consumption and maybe an underuse in Eastern Europe countries and also in areas of, of Southern Europe. So it's a very scattered pattern. But the first evidence for overprescribing in chronic lung cancer pain came from epidemiological long-term study where a very high degree based on different indicators uh, assumed that more than 20% had a uh, problematic use of opioids. And I will shortly go into some of these studies. We, we uh, made together with the, the National Institute of Public Health, the, the Danish Health and Mobility Surveys that started in 2000 and had been carried out up to now. And a common feature for these uh, surveys was that the patients were asked if they had long-term pain more than six months. And uh, we are in, in fact a, a registered country in Denmark. And, and for that reason, we quite early had uh, the opportunity to, to follow cohorts of 10,000 of adults 
days and their use of opioid benzodiazepines and, and, other, and other drugs. And uh, we have recently in this survey demonstrated that, that chronic lung cancer pain prevalence in the adult population has increased with 8.3 percentage point from 2000 to 2017. In 2017, the prevalence was 27.8% and highest among women, which has also been demonstrated in other uh, epidemiological studies from other countries. But the conclusion from uh, the Danish Health and Mobility Surveys was that the long-term opioid use in chronic non-cancer pain was associated with high pain intensity, low functional capacity, and poor quality of life. And this triad is actually what you want to obtain with the long-term treatment. On top of that, they had poor self-rated health and sleep, lower odds of recovery of chronic pain. Chronic pain is apparently not always chronic. And there were higher risk of injuries, poisoning, and all-cause mortality but to a much milder degree that, for instance, seen in the US and Canada. There was also lack of and low sexual desire. And we also found indicators of addictive behaviors in more than 20% uh, of the patients. And those indicators could be consumption of alcohol, uh, smoking behavior, um, use of illicit drugs, obesity, and a few other factors. So the way to curb and a response to opioid crisis and high use in some high income countries is definitely to uh, provide uh, guidelines and particularly the guideline from Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, from the US uh, that was published in Yama in 2016 was a guideline that 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 was uh, the foundation for many of the following guidelines, the Canadian guideline, here's an example of the Norwegian guideline and the Danish guideline in Danish. And actually this, this has led to new recommendations for opioid guidelines in cancer care. And I think that many of the things that are proposed here is very much in line with uh, the guidelines uh, from the chronic non-cancer area. And it's also worth to note that these guidelines came from uh, Eduardo Correa's group in the US, where the problem may be most pronounced. They, uh, they recommend patient assessment, both prognosis of the cancer, of course, and disposition in the patient as such, pain syndrome assessment, again, priority of drugs and treatment, and also consider non-pharmacological treatments, screening of all patients with validated tool, that's still uh, an issue of discussion, education and goal setting, for instance, exit programs or lowering doses, but also selection of drugs for long-term treatment uh, and, and doses, and also uh, exposure time. Also to monitor patient over time and use prescription databases, which has been int introduced in many countries these days, and then a collaboration with addiction medicine in patients with both a pain and uh, an addiction problem. However, there's also unintended consequences of restriction of opioids. Again, at uh, an epidemiological retrospective study in the US, where in more than 270,000 patients with poor prognosis cancers who died between 2007 and 2017, opioid use declined substantially, indicating that many of these rest rest restrictions may fall back on cancer patients even in end of life care. I want, uh, as one of the uh, last slides, to show you a little study from, a little uh, optimistic study from, from Denmark, uh, where we looked at this cancer center I'm sitting in at the moment and found that uh, two 
two cross-sectional studies with eight years apart indicated improvement of uh, pain treatment in, in this cancer center. Uh, the first study was carried out in 2011 and the second one in 2019. And overall pain relief was uh, improved in these patients statistically significant. Uh, there were also other parameters that indicated this improvement, but actually the use of uh, opioids was increased dramatically in these patients, in these patients, and also the behavior of the oncologist and hematologist indicated that they used relevant around the clock administration and also the on-demand doses was satisfactory in 2019. So opioids here had clearly provided better pain relief or had an impact on the pain treatment. Uh, in addition to that, uh, adjuvant, the use of adjuvant drugs for neuropathic pain did not change, but the oncologist and hematologist's uh, identif identification of neuropathic pain has improved. So maybe next step may be that they also use uh, uh, these drugs in a differentiated way. I think uh, I have been looking very much into the area uh, of opioid, long-term opioid treatment in high-income countries. And many of the problems I have been talking about is definitely in high-income countries. I think we should always think about a balance. And uh, for instance, in low and middle-income uh, countries where 70% of cancers and 99% of HIV death occur, only 7% of the op opioid analgesics are used. So there may be many reasons for uh, the accessibility and availability of opioids are limited and there are several barriers to that. For instance, restrictive laws, limited education, lack of prescribers, high prices, low interest from the industry, poverty in, in, in those countries, and the procurement, which include distribution, storage, and prescriptions, and also there may be misconceptions of pain and concerns about addiction and diversion, which is, of course, linked to the restrictive laws and uh, poor registration of the consumption, the national consumption. And uh, as you can see, uh, uh, especially Cicely Saunders Institute and Nami Sango and Richard Harding and others have been studying many of these barriers in order to improve uh, opioid access in uh, sub-Saharan countries. But many of these barriers are seen also in Asia and seen in, 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 and in South America. And uh, there's an immense suffering and lack of, of, of change here. On the optimistic side, there are also many programs now, Treat the Pain program, where, uh, where some of these countries can locally produce affordable and oral morphine solution. And then there's an increased training of staff. So uh, with these words and uh, with this uh, quotation from a commissioned paper in Lancet Oncology, and cloud and, and, and co-workers. I will end this talk and thank you very much for your attention.